I think having automated code samples will also make our lives so much, uh, much easier. Because of course we are like, as well, I think most of the tech writers are not experts in any of the languages yeah. that we have code samples in. So then we always have to check uh, with a number of people. And in any case, like if, if the process is manual, there's always a chance to have uh, mistakes. So and now we can just uh, kind of forget about it, which is great. There's a specialization and an understanding of documentation that goes along with doc ops, I think, that is a bit greater than, than just straight DevOps. So understanding the use case of a tech writer and what they're going to be using this tool for actually makes a big difference in how you develop it uh, and the ability to actually get the, the tool out there, you know rather than going to another team and giving them the entire use case and explaining exactly how a tech writer works and why they would want this in the first place and then hoping to get buy-in, we do it ourselves. Hello, welcome to the API The Docs podcast. We are here today to talk about DocOps and documentation automations with our guests, Paula Hank and Patrick Hammond. I was really looking forward to this episode. You two are part of the absolutely amazing group of people who are creating and maintaining documentation at Adyen. It's been almost a year uh, since we last met at Writer Docs Meetup in Amsterdam, actually at Adyen's office, I think. So yeah. uh, welcome. Hi, Paula. Hi, Patrick. Hi. Hi you are here today, Paula, as technical writer at Adyen. And uh, Patrick is DocOps project manager, as we have just agreed on your new job title. <laughs> yeah, um, so you're both project manager and uh, orchestrating or rolling out DocOps solutions. Do I understand that right? Uh, yeah, so I work with an engineer uh, type, but yeah, so it's kind of a managed architect role where you're, you're doing a bit of management, you're doing a bit of engineering, you're architecting the system and solution as well. How do you get there? You you started as a, a writer, right, Patrick, your career? Yeah, uh, well, I guess for and coder. In college, yeah, in college, it was more about programming. I, uh, I've been coding since I was a little kid, literally. And yeah, went to university, graduated into the recession, and there wasn't really a lot of jobs. So in a roundabout way, I ended up working for Apple as a communications writer. Uh, then went to a uh, sub-company of EMC called VC for a while, and that was where I began technical writing. I uh, did that for five years, and then I was like, you know what, I can combine skills here a bit and make life a bit easier for fellow tech writers, hopefully. Mm -hmm. How long are you doing that at ADM? Four years now. Uh, well, yeah, so uh, Doc Ops, we've been doing about a year and a half, two years. But yeah, I've been there for nearly five years, coming up to five years a bit. Just and crazy. Paula, you, you joined at the end as technical writer two years ago, do I remember? Yes, two, two and a bit more, I know. Yeah. And you come uh, from a technical writing background or more mathematics? Yeah, more mathematics or logic. Actually, I wasn't aware of like technical writing as a profession existing around half a year before I started the job at Adyen. Story <laughs> yeah, so I, uh, I was studying logic. Uh, I have a PhD in logic, and then I stayed around in academia for some time to do postdoc research and uh, be a lecturer. And at some point, I just wanted to do something different and wanted to work, as we call it in academia, in the real world. So, and at some point, I found uh, position of a technical writer and actually it felt to me that a lot of the things that I've already done have in a way already prepared me for it. So I applied at Adyen and I was lucky that uh, people there gave me a chance. <laughs> yeah, so that was like yeah, two, uh, almost two and a half years ago actually. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. And what types of documentation do you work with at Adyen? Yeah, so we work, uh, so Adyen is a, a payment uh, service provider. So we uh, uh, give uh, solutions for merchants that allow them to uh, process payments, so both mm -hmm. online payments, uh, but also in store with uh, terminals. And then we write uh, documentations for their developers to allow them to build these integrations. So it's quite a wide range of uh, 
documentation. So it's uh, both just integration guides, so API integration guides, but we also have our front end solutions. Uh, then we have the whole point of sale documentation for in-store payments. But then there is also some stuff that is even like less technical, for example, writing about the finances, how to do your reporting, where does the money come from when you do refunds? So it's quite a wide range of uh, different topics. And after, yeah, even after two years, I'm still uh, learning new things. <laughs> um, you're time. both involved in, in all types of docs? Yes. Or more the management of those docs? Yeah. No, so, the right. Yeah, so it's quite, uh, so at least until uh, now, we haven't been just specialized uh, in our team. Like you're not specialized on one uh, product, but usually you get you get assigned different products over time. So you can really like learn to know how the whole platform works. Yeah. So honorary finances degree and engineering. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, it sometimes feels like that. It yeah. can be as technical almost. You've got yeah. you've got two kinds of nerds in Adian. You've you've financial nerds and you've code nerds, right? <laughs> so they're they're both as nerdy as each other, just a different type of nerd. Yeah. I, today you're wearing the Doc Ops hat, right? So we're here to talk about Doc Ops because Patrick, you're gonna have a presentation at API Dedux also about the Doc Ops processes that you yeah. worked out. And um we would also like to ask about linters, but before we started recording this podcast, <laughs> it turned out that uh, you have a, sometimes a lot of relationship with linters, so that's going to be very interesting to ask. How does DocOps roll out at Adian? Like, um, how, even the, the expression DocOps is new, right, on it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we treat it kind of the way, I suppose, development teams treat DevOps to an extent, in that we're like a, a supporting wing of the, the documentation and DevX stream, or we're now just the DevX stream actually. So we're, we're designing uh, or getting access to tools that will make life easier for technical writers and for other members of the documentation team. Um, and that can be everything from checking broken links to doing uh, linting of documentation, as you said. We're running DocOps as a team to support the operations that are needed for documentation, you know? So that goes to tools, that goes to the CMS, that goes to anything that a technical writer that could make their job a bit easier. How big is the technical writing group at Adian now? For whom are you creating these DocOps? Yeah, how many tech writers do we have? We're nine now. Oh my god. Yeah. And a bunch of front end people. We have uh, also developer advocates. So I think the entire team is about twenty people. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you're you're talking plus about a few hundred programmers. <laughs> yeah, indeed. I think I do have to ask that again. Like so DevOps doc ops, yes, but since a lot of what the documentation is if it's not marketing and sales documentation is still code. So there is still like some semi permeable membrane there. Yeah, definitely there's crossover, but there's a specialization and an understanding of documentation that goes along with doc ops. I think that is a bit greater than, than just straight DevOps. So understanding the use case of a tech writer and what they're going to be using this tool for actually mm -hmm. makes a big difference in how you develop it. Uh, and the ability to actually get the, the tool out there, you know, rather than going to another team and giving them the entire use case and explaining exactly how a tech writer works and why they would want this in the first place and then hoping to get buy in, we do it ourselves. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, it becomes a lot more of a direct thing that you can work on. It also means that we have, I mean, we have front end developers, we have, we have back end and front end developers on the team. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not a, it's not the kind of thing where having developers on our documentation team is unusual anyway. And yeah, it just saves having a, another layer that you have to go through to get things done. Mm -hmm. So how does DocOps enable your work on a practical level, for example? From my point of view, there's a few things that we want to do. So one is providing tools that the tech writers can work within, mm -hmm. whether that's the CMS or in the future, we'll be doing a bit more you know, plugins for IDEs and that kind of stuff um, mm -hmm. to integrate some of the tools that we're building. 
but then also doing stuff for the end user of the documentation. So like I mentioned, broken link checking or mm -hmm. checking for missing resources, missing images, that kind of stuff. Um, and then we can also do a certain amount of non-linting checking for specific stuff that without involving the linter, like security checks for passwords or you know, that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. yeah, it makes life a little bit easier there for management. But Paula, you could probably speak yeah. to the tech no, writer experience. Okay. I think everything you said, I think the point is like to take away the bits that we humans are well bad at and we like checking broken links and we can use our time like more efficiently dealing with other things uh, and like automate as much as possible. So, and also like, it also means using reuse as much as possible with parameters and conditional reuse. So also then if you like need to make changes, you can do it so much faster and also well just to uh mention also patrick's upcoming talk i think having automated code samples will also make our lives so much uh much easier because of course we are like as well i think most of the tech writers are not experts in any of the languages yeah. that we have code samples in so then we always have to check uh with a number of people and in any case like if if the process is manual there's always a chance to have uh, mistakes. So and now we can just uh, kind of forget about it, which is great. The most obvious place where I guess we can see this as, is at the ADN Explorer, uh, but there's also docs.adn.com. And with the payment gateway, there's a lot of industry domain documentation that also comes into the picture, a lot of uh, business-oriented documentation that for the sake of people like me, hopefully it does not include too many code samples. Uh, how does the, the adoption work? Because I, I assume you first started with uh, the more code oriented automations and to make sure that there is no mistakes, that copy paste does work and all your code samples does work. But when it comes to link update, any kind of uh, images being right where they are, just linting for your style guide, that involves also the marketing department. You can, that could be great help for them, but how, how do you drive the adoption? You mean, uh, how do we get the marketing team to adopt tools that DocUps has come up with? Yeah, or? because it's like, you know, everybody has their, their daily environment and what fits one group may not fit another group, but it would be really yeah. great if they met somewhere halfway. I think there's definitely a scope there. We don't do it currently. Um, like uh, when we do linting or when we do broken link checking or what have you, it's all done in docs. As far as I know, our marketing team have a separate tool for it, but they have way less pages and stuff. So there's, it's a very, very different use case. Mm -hmm. We're talking about, you know, doing uh, checks on 1,500 pages within the docs domain. But yeah, I mean, technically there's nothing to stop you from including marketing in the future. But uh yeah, right now our scope is limited to docs alone. Mm -hmm. And is there plans for uh, for learning this out further, or or the separation is just it's so per se that it's better not to not to try to force something that is not organically happening? Yeah, I think like it's just such a different type of content and such a different use case. Like there's there's no specific plan to start running. DocOps tools on, on marketing content or anything like that at the moment anyway. But that, yeah, never say never. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's a hard to answer question, but what can be automated and what not regarding docs? Do you have some kind of experience? Yeah, um, it's, a, it's also a good question. I'm sorry, Paolo, I feel like I'm answering all these questions. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, so the, the main thing is that like, um, from my own point of view, I had a, a level of experience as a tech writer in IDN to know what stuff annoyed me, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good place to start when it comes to automation. What is the stuff that is annoying? What's the stuff you don't want to do on your own? You don't want to go from page to page clicking links to go back to a tired, broken link checker example. Yeah. So then the immediate thought is, all right, well, we need a way to do this in an automated way. And um, that's that's basically been my job in Doc Ops is identifying things that are difficult, repetitive, 
processes that there's a lot of cause you know a, a lot of potential for error uh, a lot of uh, reasons to automate them so hope that answers your question that's how i define yeah. what we automate anyway <laughs> And in your experience, I don't know. In your, I don't what? know. I, think, uh, I couldn't have put it better. I think it's really like if you're doing something and it's annoying, and you're also it's if it's the kind of thing that you can easily make mistakes, and you know, and you know that a machine wouldn't and would do it much faster. Like that's the that's the clue. What's uh What's the latest new development that you were? Okay, this is not a trick question, but uh, that you were kind of surprised that this can actually be automated, that it makes sense to automate that. Like you didn't expect mm -hmm. that, that that would be better. Um, we all have this hubris as humans and then you slowly build that down. But... Yeah, at Eddie and we always expect something to be better, you know, it's, it's our job to make <laughs> yeah. things better, you know. Um, oh, uh, gosh, that's a, that's a difficult one. Like with the code sample automation, I think it was a it was a slam dunk because nobody wants to edit a hundred and forty different files. You know, you want to edit in one place and then generate from that. That's the ideal, right? So I think, to be honest, most of the stuff it it has kind of been an obvious candidate for automation. There's been nothing where we've kind of gone like, oh, well, that's a uh, gosh, I didn't expect that to be automable or what have you. What about you, fellow? What do you reckon? You had that experience. Hi. I also don't remember anything where I'm surprised that it can be automated. I think there have been a few cases where we just wasn't the, weren't aware of what's actually possible with our tools already. And then we kind of discover that and it's like, oh, yeah. great. we can now use reuse with parameters, for example, and then it makes uh, lives easier. But yeah, it's not, I can't remember a case where I was like conceptually surprised that this is Mm. Yeah. And I think like even when we were when we were designing the CMS originally or when we were putting forward the, the different things that we wanted, one of those things was conditional reuse, you know. Mm. So it's mm. like it's been a feature. We just didn't know exactly how it would work. But uh, then the tech writers and, uh, and ourselves worked together to figure that out. And in retrospective, what is surprisingly hard to automate well? <laughs> uh, everything everything is kind of hard to automate well it, it it yeah you know like um i'll give you an example so you decide again and i i will keep going back to broken link checker because it was one of the first things we automated but you decide to automate broken link checking and all of a sudden you are introducing a whole bunch of problems like now we've got to deal with firewalls and now we've got to make requests to all these different websites all from one single location to those websites like you making a request in that way so it, it what sounds like an easy task at the start can kind of unravel into more and more difficult subtasks that uh that take more and more effort but like one of the things that we're discovering now we're doing more work to the linter and you know we're trying to we're trying to automate some style guide stuff in the linter without going into too much detail on it and uh one of the things that you find is that there are a lot of rules in let's say the microsoft style guide that are just really obscure and that will probably never actually occur like it's words that yeah we just wouldn't really use in the docs and then all of mm -hmm. a sudden you're doing you know, you're spending, there's, there's resources being used to check for words that will probably never occur. And how do you make that more efficient? And you know, how, how do you avoid redundancies? You don't want to go down too far down the path of automating everything and then find out actually no one is going to need this automated. So there is a balance there, definitely. And also, once you strike that balance, you also have to inform the users of the linters, like to what extent can you trust that this is fully checked right yeah yeah and i think like that's like without are, are we are we on linter talk now uh <laughs> linter chat, i don't know um, <laughs> yeah, but, 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 <laughs> sorry. Like, i'm just I, i'm imagining annette getting very angry and shouting <laughs> no linters um, no it's okay but uh like i think that that was one of the things actually that i noticed conceptually with people when we first started talking about linting is that they think that this is that it is like your spell check in Microsoft Word, right? It's either right or wrong and you do what it says. But with linting, it's not like that because yeah. there's context in the sentence 
Now we are we are looking at developing a linter that can be a little bit better with context and sentence, but even then, there's a limit to how how correct it can be. So there has to be a grain of salt taken with tech writers where when they are going through the results of a linter that they're going, okay, this bit of feedback was useful, this other bit of feedback, not so much. And then that we refine and refine that linter to the point where it is delivering results that are useful for our tech writers. Yeah, and in documentation, there is a point where you just shouldn't neglect the human eyes, so. Yeah, no, like, and I think people have this fear and that's one of the things that I've noticed in general with automation is like they think, Oh, we're getting rid of the human that needs to do that and it's like no you're you're reducing the amount the human has to look over things hopefully but it's still we still live in a world where yeah you still want to be looking at your page before you even send it to the linter right you you want to make sure that your quality of work is as good as possible and then you use automated processes to try and find stuff that you might not have noticed just with your fragile human eyes and we are writing for humans as well so yeah exactly yeah. So how do you tell your reviewers what is lent to them, what what isn't? Like, do you just trust uh, the 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 instinctual reviewer's eyes, like they will catch if there's something wrong, or do they have to read through the documentation of the linter itself? Like, what are we looking for? What are we not? Like, how? how... I think there's too much information good. and there's too little information. That's what I'm fishing for. Yeah. Like, um, Paula, actually, you could probably speak to the peer review process that we have a bit better than I can, and I've been talking for ages, so. How does peer reviewing work in Adyen first off? And I'll explain then where the role of the linter is. Okay, so peer reviewing, so actually, usually, whenever we're assigned a task, we're always assigned a peer reviewer, so that from the moment, like, from the moment when you start working on the task, you can always talk to the other person about even like bigger questions, like how to structure the page and so on. And then you work on the page and then uh, there is a final peer review that can even be after publishing, where the point is then also to check for consistency with our style guide, for example. Mm -hmm. And one of the main principles that we kind of operate on is get the document out and worry about the the details of it later on as long as it's correct mm -hmm. technically that's that's the main focus because we're in a really fast moving industry so it's really mm -hmm. really yeah. important to get docs out there so then let's say we do a peer review process after it's published and that all goes well at that stage then a tech writer can elect if they wish to lint uh, also so it's kind of like a final check for stuff like our own style guide internal stuff but you're still it, you're still only capturing what a human maybe didn't notice you know the idea is never that it would replace all human review at least in my mind i don't i don't see it being being that level of automated either yeah so no the robots are not taking over tech writer jobs we don't need to worry there <laughs> and i mean yeah i i think in the end also peer review is about so much more than just checking yeah. consistency with this style guide it's also like does the whole page make sense does it make sense how the information is structured, how it is visually presented. In context. So again, it's the same thing that it just takes away this annoying step where you have to look up in the style guide whether backend is written one or two words. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like it's it's the, the material for sci-fi is that can an AI take into account your emotional state and uh, your tolerance levels <laughs> for <laughs> How long is this thing? <laughs> it's written by someone smarter than me, then yes. Yeah, that's like, I think mean, it's the world we're going to, right? Once we're all interfaced with our Apple Watches and we're all networked at that stage, it can go, hey, your heart rate is after rising a bit high. Are you are you stressed out in your documentation process today? <laughs> Would you like me to lint the doc for you? You never know. We could eventually get to that level of automation. <laughs> Right now, I'm pretty sure that I can't ask more about linting. <laughs> so ahead, I'm, I'm in, oh, I just need to quit. So I'm interested in what skills have you been picking up recently or what tools or methods are you now learning? Well, since, uh, so when I started at ADN, we were still uh, using Confluence for docs, but then uh, in about a year in, 
uh, we switched uh, to Docs's code. So related to that, there were like a lot of things that the whole tech writing team had to pick up if they didn't know this already. So like working in Markdown, uh, using Git uh, for a workflow, also for uh, peer reviews. Yeah, so these are a few examples if you mind. And everybody had their own uh, trajectory or did you agree with the team? Like, okay, now we agree that by the end of this quarter, everybody will know how that works. Uh, yeah, I think there were some of some, there was some of it. We like, coordinated on some bits, but then also I think a lot of things, it, it just came according to the need. So if you need to do something, then you just kind of ask someone or look, look up how it uh, works. Okay. So that's a next blog post topic, or uh, maybe even a meetup topic. Like, please yeah, tell us how do you switch an entire team from Confluence to Doc Ops? We would really like to know that. But the part of how we did it was by having a team where you have developers and tech writers on the same team that are working together. So, like, how many companies have you worked in where the documentation team didn't have their own developers and then had to go to? another team and try and get people to work on it and uh, do they really think that documentation is as important as we do and you're you're doing a whole bunch of convincing and finagling whereas when it came time to switch over to a different cms and a whole different way of doing things and if there's a feature request that comes in doc, a, a, a tech writer can literally walk over to someone and go hey we need to be able to do this this would be cool and they can sit down together and define what that looks like the level of focus on documentation at Adyen is something that I haven't seen at a lot of companies. You know, they they really really take it seriously, and that as a documentarian is special. Mm. And why is it so important? So, what do you think? What is the bare minimum for DocOps? You think every IT company should fulfill in an ideal world, or what makes difference? It, it kind of depends on. Um, the size of documentation set, so of like how, how much docs you have and uh, what industry you're in and stuff as well. I think the there is no one size fits all solution. If I was still working at the last place I worked, I would probably be saying data OT is the only way to go. That's the that's the gold standard. Um, but it doesn't work for every company, you know, the that it's a very specific use case that needs something that structured. So yeah, I think the as far as kind of general advice to companies on how to adopt doc ops, I think one of the main things is to figure out what your use case is, what you actually need. Talk to tech writers, sit down with them, find the tech writer who is also a bit of a code monkey in his spare time or her spare time, and just you know work with them to to define what what kind of tools they would like, because there are going to be people on your team that have an idea of what they want to work with you. Know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, there is no golden rule, but don't you think there are some key elements which should be adapted, no matter um, the size of the company or a team? Yeah, I mean, like, uh, you should know that there is no broken content in your docs. So mm -hmm. some kind of busted, broken stuff report, I think everyone has to have. But you don't, you know, not everyone has to go to the extremes of glinting or, or what have you. Um, but yeah, you should know what's broken in your docs because it's really difficult for a tech writer to swim through the entire documentation set and find every problem, you know. So if I was going to start somewhere, that's where I'd start. It also puts the bar a bit higher, right? Once you have this experience, like um, Paula, is there something that you would say, this is non negotiable? I don't want to work without this anymore well uh, yeah i i think like checking broken links is definitely uh something and i think uh well actually also after we have the code sample automation i think i would be annoyed having to like manually <laughs> check these things again <laughs> yeah so that's gonna be part of uh probably our car it's like uh Tech writer persona. This is what I think is the bare minimum. <laughs> no broken link. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. Like, um, and I mean, like for Paula, this was your first job in the industry. I can't yeah. imagine 
going into my first job and almost immediately being in docs as code and being in, in all of these different flows that are also new to documentation in general. Yeah. Paula was kind of lucky in the sense that, you know, you're, she walked straight into uh, the cutting edge, let's say, rather than having to kind of start off with whatever, one of the more legacy tools. I don't want to diss anyone's favorite tool. So, you know, that, that gives a kind of a fresh perspective that you can't get from even tech writers that are already in the industry and stuff. So it's mm -hmm. been really useful to go to Paula and go like, what do you think of this thing as fresh eyes to the industry? Yeah. yeah. But on the other hand, I think I, I mean, I almost feel like lucky that I could also see how Confluence works still for yeah. the next year. So I, I don't get the illusion that it's just normal. <laughs> Makes <laughs> 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 me feel grateful. <laughs> That's <a> new... <laughs> <laughs> I have still seen a dial phone. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if you understand what a rotary phone is, you know when someone makes that motion with their hand, what they're referring yes. to, right? Uh, or when they hold it like this. Yes. Uh, all visual jokes for a podcast. <laughs> so this is a question for both Paula and Patrick. Do you have a message you want to leave the listener with? You go first, Paula. Um, yeah, well, I think it's something that we already mentioned several times here that automation and it doesn't mean that uh, that uh, the text writers will start jobs or so it will just take the yeah the annoying bits away yeah like i'd, I'd probably say similar like uh doc ops is worthwhile to invest in um knowing about problems is better than not knowing about problems you know and uh yeah and, and docs is code uh in general if 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 you are sick of whatever way you're working, do a proof of concept where you try Doxis code. I think uh, working in Git and working with Markdown is very intuitive. Thank you. And thank you for being here. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Was fun. Fun. Thank you. It was nice talking to you. Thank you for listening to the API The Docs podcast. This episode was sponsored by Adyen, a gold sponsor of the API The Docs virtual conference series. If you go to the website apidocs.org, you can find the recaps and recordings of past presentations from the conference, as well as the upcoming program. Until next time, be well.